Um, buonasera a tutte e tutti. Uh, io mi chiamo Barbara Borg e sono professoressa qui alla Scuola Normale di Archeologia Classica. Um, uh, io sono arrivato solo il settembre scorso, quindi il mio italiano parlato non è ottimo e per questa ragione um, vorrei presentare la mia lezione in inglese. Ma capisco abbastanza bene l'italiano e se volete um, chiedere in, in italiano va tutto bene per me. Um, and I'm switching now to English. Uh, if you have any questions during the lecture, please don't hesitate just to ask. Um, if I, I like always talking with people rather than talking to people. So if you have any questions, just interrupt and let me know and, and we can clarify certain points which you are particularly interested in. Or if you didn't understand me very well for whatever reason, please don't hesitate just to interrupt and ask. Okay? Right. Um, so, um, I would like to talk to you about a monument which I am sure all of you know and probably all of you have seen in the past, which is the Column of Trajan in Rome. It is probably one of the most famous monuments of Roman art. And so one might think that, um, you know, perhaps we know all about it and it's very obvious what it is. Um, it is um, the one here on the right. Um, and here we have a detail of that column. This is actually the column of Marcus Aurelius, um, which we will very briefly talk about um, towards the end of this lecture. Um, the column of, Mar of Trajan, I am sure you all know that um, the um, spiraled relief um, presents events from the Dacian Wars um, of Trajan. Um, and so, to some extent, uh, these are what used to be called historical reliefs because they relate to a real historical event that did take place, as we know from uh, the written sources, and from lots of inscriptions that celebrate Trajan for his victories in Dacia. So we know that this event happened and uh, we can re and we know from sources that this column was celebrating the Dacian Wars. And so um, it is one of the prime examples of a kind of Roman art um, uh, that, that, that is considered typically, typically Roman. And to some extent, this is obviously right because the Greeks never did anything like this. The Greek, Greek art, Greek reliefs are almost exclusively mythological. There are a few exceptions, um, but very few. Most of it is mythological reliefs and it is always considered a speciality um, of the Romans to have created um, extended artworks in relief that relate to real life historical events, um, as well as portraiture and a few other things. But I'm getting ahead of myself. Um, I would like to very briefly introduce the location um, of uh, the column uh, in the uh, plan here. I hope you can see um, all of that very well. It doesn't matter if you can't read all the writing here. Um, we see here the Basilica Emilia and the Curia Iulia of the Forum Romanum. So the Forum Romanum would be about here. And uh, in these different colors, we have the fora that were built by various emperors, the forum of Caesar here in pink, the one of Augustus in green, and the forum of Trajan um, to which the column belongs is depicted here in blue. It is the largest of the imperial fora. Um, also on the uh, slopes of the hill, we have the 
uh, Mercati Traiani, uh, which don't strictly belong to the forum, what were built in the say at the same time. So this huge pro um, um, a complex uh, was uh, built um, on the order of Trajan uh, by the architect Apollodorus of Damascus. Uh, one of the very few names of architects we actually have um, for ancient Rome. And, and that's something I, I can't talk about today, but a phenomenon that's really very interesting that we have, we know so many artists' names from the Greek, um, the, the list is wrong here. Um, we have so many artists' names from, uh, from ancient Greece, um, but we have hardly any uh, for the Roman world, very, very few, and even fewer architects. For Greece, we have, you know, lots of architects, but for Rome, we don't. And that's a very interesting phenomenon. But as I said, we can't talk about that in detail today. Um, just um, to mention that we do have the name of the architect in the case of the Forum of Trajan um, is an exception to the rule. The forum was built uh, between roughly 106, or the, 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 the column was built roughly between 106 and 112 AD. Um, and um, you have a model here of the same um, amalgamation of buildings. The forum, this is the, the, the Basilica Emilia and the Curia in the Forum Romanum, uh, the Forum of Julius Caesar here the form of Augustus here, which you can always identify from these semicircle halls, which you can also see here in, this, in, in the plan. Um, and then the huge one, uh, the form of Trajan with the markets on the slope. And those of you who are a bit familiar with Rome, there is now this beautiful museum in the Mercati where you can walk from shop to shop on, uh, uh, on the ancient roads. Um, the forum in itself is very interesting. Uh, in its architecture, it, it consists of a huge um, courtyard with colonnades all around um, and a, a large basilica, so a covered space, and then an, a small courtyard and two libraries, a Greek one and a Latin one. But we need to recall that libraries, what, what the Romans called libraries, were not mostly not libraries where you would find um, literary texts, but libraries were very often mainly archives. So you would find maybe some literary texts, but mainly um, archival documents in which um, the authors that we know, the historians, uh, would go to study uh, the history of the city and events and, and things like that. Uh, but still, a, a Greek and a Latin one. And in between those, um, there was the column. So in a relatively narrow space. I should also perhaps very briefly mention that the exact shape of the forum and its entrance situation is still a matter of huge debate between experts who are working on the excavations in Rome. Um, it is um, it, it it was thought for a long time that actually in at this end there wasn't a huge entrance, but there was then the temple of the deified Trajan just adjacent to that. Um, uh, now it seems much more likely that there was a huge entrance portal. And uh, no, I'm not showing that in this presentation, um, but it looks like there was a proper entrance to the forum, first into the courtyard where the column is, through this large basilica, multifunctional building into then the courtyard, about which we are not going to talk any further. Just to mention these exedrae, these semicircular um, uh, halls, 
are obviously a quotation from the Forum of Trajan. So like we have quotations in texts that Roman authors have, you know, little lines from Virgil or from Homer, and you have quotations in texts, you also have quotations of artistic feature or architectural features by which the person who commissions those monuments uh, wants to align themselves with a famous precedent or, as in this case, we can probably assume, um, align themselves with the figure of Augustus, who by the time of Trajan has been in the, the undisputed um, superior emperor uh, not controversial at all. And so, you know, claiming that you are continuing the policies and being of a similar, being an emperor of a similar kind to Augustus was always a legitimizing strategy, something that would reflect well on you. So these quotations of architectural elements are surely, uh, you know, uh, done on purpose and not just an accident of, you know, or or, or just a, just a design feature. They are a meaningful design feature. But moving on to the column proper, I'm showing you here. The column is uh, presented on an aureus on several coins with a portrait of Trajan uh, on the other uh, on the other side. Um, where you can see, you know, the base and then the column itself. Um, the details are obviously not visible, but we can see from that uh, coin, from those coins as well, that originally there was a statue of Trajan on top of it. So one could say that the whole column is essentially a base for a statue, like the triumphal arches were bases for the statuary that was on top, which is just lost to us because anything metal was typically molten down and then recycled for um, for for other um, statues often. In this particular case, this is, of course, a very, very elaborate uh, base for uh, for uh, the statue with the reliefs about which we want to talk about uh, more. Um, what you can appreciate from this nice um, virtual reconstruction is um, that uh, this space was actually very, very narrow. And so a lot of debate um, goes around whether or not these reliefs were actually visible when you were standing there on the uh, on on the bottom, and to what extent people could actually follow the events um, that uh, were depicted on the column, and I'm going to come back to this um, uh, towards uh, more towards the end of this lecture, um, but I think uh, this this image gives some impression of of how you would you know what what the situation would be. But those of you who have been in Rome. Uh, will know, you know, will will have made up their your own minds. Um, it should be mentioned that there were balconies around here, so at least there was the chance for those who were allowed to access in the into the libraries and uh, onto the balconies to see the upper part of the column a little bit better. But we do not know who was actually granted permission to enter into those buildings. So probably this was a relatively limited number of people and not just anyone coming from the street could climb up there um, and enjoy the view. Um, one aspect I would like to mention uh, right at the beginning is that it has been pointed out by some scholars quite rightly and quite importantly that the column was in antiquity never as white as it is today. This is a photograph of the situation um, as you find it now when you go to Rome. So it was never white like it is today, but like all sculpture, uh, all marble sculpture, it was brightly painted. And uh, this is an attempt at a color reconstruction uh, where you can see, you know, sort of how 
how the color helps us pick out details much more easily than when it is just the white marble for everything. So uh, this would make it more readable um, with, with the colors involved. Um, and you can also see another feature of the column here in this uh, in this section. Um, there is the rectangular base, which you can also see in the photograph here. And through the door on the one side, you would enter into a small room and then be able to go up the stairs all around the column, which you can still do today. Um, this was a kind of maintenance staircase, but also, you know, we don't know for what the, the platform was actually used, um, but the whole column is hollow and you could walk up the spiral staircase. I am going to mention only briefly without discussing that in great detail, that um, for most of most of most of most scholars, used to think until very recently that inside the bays, inside this sockle of the column, there were the uh, scenery um, urns, the ash urns with the burned bones of Trajan and his wife uh, Plot uh, Pl Plotina. Um, that they were buried so that this column was actually the burial place of the emperor. Um, there are very good reasons to doubt that this was the case. Um, but at the moment, the discussion is still a little bit open with some scholars still thinking that it is likely it was where the tomb of Trajan was, while others think that the tomb was more likely outside um, of the column somewhere very close by, um, and we but we wouldn't know exactly where. Um, briefly, the um, there is an inscription above the door, um, and that reads: "The Senate and people of Rome give or dedicate this column to the Emperor Caesar, some of the divine Nerva, Nerva Trajanus Augustus Germanicus Dacicus." Pontifex Maximus in his 17th year in the office of tribune, having been acclaimed, acclaimed six times as imperator, six times consul, pater patriae, and to demonstrate of what great height the hill was and place that was removed for such great works. Now, this is a remarkable inscription which tells us quite a lot um, it says nothing of the burial of Trajan, by the way, uh, which maybe we would expect if it was in, in, in fact um, dedicated as the burial space. First of all, it is not a column that was erected by Trajan, but for Trajan. And that makes a great difference. We should always pay attention to who it actually was who dedicated those monuments. So not every, so everything we see is propaganda of the emperor, but monuments were usually dedicated by the Senate or by other bodies or even individuals to the emperor. Obviously, they would not dedicate anything to the emperor which they knew the emperor would not like. Um, that would be silly. Um, but, um, and I talked about this um, in another lecture, which I don't know whether any of you attended, um, it, it does mean that whoever is dedicating, in this case, the Senate and the people of Rome, could stress characteristics of the emperor, which they particularly liked about him, and thereby signaling, you know, it, it will be nice if you were this kind of emperor. So there is a message going on. It is not just a one way, it is not the, the, the message, not just a one way street, you know, advertising something to the people of Rome, but it is also a negotiation with the emperor about essentially what kind of emperor he should be and what the values are of the people and Senate of Rome, um, which they, you know, hope to be sharing with the emperor. Um, the other thing is this very, this very end, 
to demonstrate of what great height the hill was and place that was removed for such great works. And that refers to uh, the fact that in order to build the forum, maybe I should go back to the, to the plans here, in order to build this huge forum, part of the hills had to be removed in order to generate a plain space. Obviously, Rome is a very hilly place and everybody who's walking through Rome knows that very well. It's tiring to go up and down the hills all the time and to make space for this huge building. They had to dig down and and remove part of the hill. Um, and the claim is that the height of the column actually indicates the height of the hill that has been removed. Now, whether that is strictly true, we can't, we cannot tell because the hill is no longer there. Um, but the the essence, the idea, is certainly something we should take seriously. That this um, that that the column is always also advertising an incredible engineering feat. And this is another theme we will encounter also on the on the column inside. So an amazing pride in having managed to change to change the topography and the landscape of Rome. Um, I mean, they didn't have any lorries. They couldn't just, you know, take take equipment and and just load this stone on lorries and carry it away. It was really painstaking work to put it on ox carts and then carry it outside of the city or to some other building site. So, so this was a massive undertaking and they were rightly proud of that. Uh, what is remarkable is that they even put this pride onto the inscription um, on the base of the column. Um, Let's look at the images of the column itself, uh, which is the main uh, main subject of today. Um, I already mentioned that the column depicts events from the Dacian Wars of Trajan. Um, those were um, were were two two separate wars. Um, a first one that was victorious for the Romans. Um, but not disastrous for the Dacians. They uh, negotiated a truce with the um, with the ruler, with the king of the Dacians, Decebalus, um, according to which he was becoming a client king, but with some measure, some degree of independence. Um, uh, and but um, Decebalus used the the the, the peace. And also the money he had been given from by the Roman state um, to support his rule. He used that money and the peace in order to equip an army and collect a new army. And he was threatening then uh, the Roman, the Romans, or at least this is how the Romans perceived the activities going on in Dacia. So uh, Trajan went in. Uh, with uh, to to carry out another war, which then ended also in the suicide of Decebalus um, and a victory and the destruction of the capital, um, the the Dacian capital, an outright wicked victory. And we can see events from both those campaigns, um, starting off with not with you know, the troops leaving Rome, but with the troops crossing the Danube. Um, and, and this is, uh, uh, you know, you can, you can see how th this is the personification of the river Danube, and you see all the water here. So the bridge that is actually helping the army crossing the Danube is made of lots of boats, which were tied next to each other. So here they are leaving. Um, then in the middle of the column, we have uh, the goddess of victory, uh, who is inscribing on a shield 
the victory that had uh, that that um, was the end of the First Dacian War. But then the war carries on and it ends actually with uh, right at the top, here's the capital, right at the top with the suicide of De Kebalus. Um, not sure you can see that very clearly. This is him and he is holding a dagger, which, which he is pointing at himself like this to stab himself in the belly and commit suicide. And then there are just a few scenes where the Romans are, are taking over the capital uh, of Segetuza. Um, so, uh, so, and and we can actually also um, uh, identify a number of events on the column um, as events that occurred in the Dacian Wars, and this is because we have uh, Cassius Dio's Roman history, who also narrates the events of the Dacian Wars, and there are just a few. Um, excerpts uh, from which we know about the campaigns and uh, some of these events we can identify on the column. So I'm, uh, I'm, I'm just reading a few. So there, here Trajan made a campaign against the Dacians for he took into account their past deeds and observed that their power and their pride were increasing. So, so that is him, you know, getting worried that they might actually um, uh, overrun the border into the Roman Empire. So he, that is the Kebalus, reluctantly engaged to surrender his arms. This was after he had come to Trajan, falling upon the ground and done obse obeisance and thrown away his arms. So that is the end of the First Station War, where um, he is, um, where he is, um, you know, declaring his defeat and then accepting the clemency of the emperor um, and, and is allowed to survive and to even stay as ruler of Dacia, but as a client king. Um, uh, then Trajan celebrates a triumph, obviously, as De Kebalos was reported to him to be acting contrary to the treaty in many ways. The Senate again declared him an enemy and Trajan once more conducted the war against him in person instead of entrusting it to, uh, um, of the others and so on. So we know quite a few events from uh, the historical records, which can then be matched also with some of the scenes we see on the column. For this reason, um, it is quite understandable that scholars have thought for a very long time that this is actually a very faithful um, depiction of all the events that occurred during the Dacian Wars. And um, until the early 19, uh, 20th century, there have also been lots of attempts to um, to increase our understanding of the actual events, because um, Cassius Dio is relatively brief. He doesn't talk about every single detail. And so people thought, well, if we only observe the reliefs very carefully, maybe we can even enhance our knowledge of the precise events that happened. Um, since you are art historians, I should mention that this understanding of the column, and not that, not just this column, also other Roman reliefs, um, as faithful representations of real historical events, has not just um, given those reliefs the name historical reliefs, which feels natural, but it also had a number of consequences in terms of judging what Roman art is. Um, as you may or may not know, um, Roman art, to define Roman art, has been a bit of a challenge for a very long time. And um, because the Romans copied a lot of Greek art, and so Roman art was for the most part defined as those kinds of of artistic production that was not copying Greek art. The copying of Greek art was 
looked down upon by scholars and art historians because copying was not original, it was not inventive, it was just, you know, re redoing what the wonderful Greeks had done much better before. Um, but Roman art was considered the kind of things that the Greeks did not do, like representations, extended representations of real life events rather than mythology. On the other hand, the idea of what art is prevented also sort of appreciating these reliefs as proper art because the term art in the modern world was linked with ideas, of course, of originality, but also of art being autonomous, art not being done for a specific purpose, and, um, and, 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 and art inspiring contemplation but not something that gives a message about something quite practical and historical and teaching the people of what happened during the Dacian Wars or being a piece of propaganda. Propaganda was never thought of as being true art. And so um, while scholars started in the early 20th century to appreciate um, the originality of the Romans in doing something that the Greeks did not do before, it was not precisely what they conceptualized as true art. Um, and this is actually something that, had ha that has had enormous influence on how Roman monuments were then studied later on. Even when it was understood that actually, and we are coming to that point in a moment, that Roman that that these monuments, these columns, for instance, are not faithful representations of you know the artist coming along on the wall and on the wall um, and and making his drawings or drawing on a report and making the drawings according to a written report. Um, even when it was understood that this is not what was happening here, it was um, still obviously a rep representation of something political and useful and thereby not exactly what was conceptualized as art. The appreciation of Roman monuments like that came really when classical archaeology, at least in certain sectors, um, changed from having a merely art historical approach in the sense that um, that people tried to identify masters like they did in vase painting or with Greek sculpture or to identify certain styles and doing this sort of intricate in, uh, uh, inter, um, interpretation of the artistic qualities um, and, and the masters who created the art. But um, when classical archaeologists started to conceive of themselves also as historians, so that they were using the art to understand something about ancient societies. Um, including, of course, the politics that happened at the time and the way that ideologies were communicated to the wider world, how power was negotiated between Rome and the provinces, between the emperor and the senate, between the elite and the wider population of Rome and the provinces. So once it was understood or it was or, or there was a, a new interest in using artistic production for historical questions, um, at that point, research on Roman art really took off and became a major field of research. 
And there are, of course, big um, uh, Italian uh, figures like Ranuncio Bianca Bandinelli was one of the most important people who started this kind of research, but also a number of German scholars who have really, in a way, invented Roman art history, but as a kind of historical discipline. Um, and it is only even more recently, it's always difficult to put an exact date to something, but let's say in, in the 1990s and in, in the 2000s, that actually people have also seen that looking at art from an artistic point of view, from the design point of view, and looking at it from an historian's point of view, is not contradictory, is not exclusive, but that we get the most information out of it when we combine the two. And I hope um, you can see that uh, in, in when, when we go on to interpreting uh, the, the reliefs on the column. The first thing perhaps to point out, which um, what, what scholars observed when they realized that the column doesn't really faithfully depict actually what happened at every time was that they identified a number of themes, a number of recurring scenes which were not exactly copied on different parts of the column, but themes like this one, for instance, where the emperor Trajan um, is speaking to his soldiers. Now, this, this, you know, if you think of a war um, and what's important in war, you could say, you know, what, what what, why is this important? Why depict the emperor talking to his troops? You know, of course he talks to his troops, but, you know, I don't care. Um, but it is really remarkable that we have many scenes on the column where Trajan is talking to his troops. So that begs then the question, was this just the artist not having any fantasy of doing something more interesting? Or was, it, was there perhaps a message that was important to them, even though maybe we didn't get it initially, we didn't understand why this was important. And in fact, um, when we look at coins, um, we can see in abbreviated format um, that um, the emperor speaking to troops, but also sometimes to other groups of people, um, uh, is depicted also on coins. And now this is obviously no accident. This is not done to fill space, but this is really meaningful. And we can see that there are on the coins also labels. And for instance, the emperor speaking to his troops is called ad locutio. So he is addressing the troops. And this must have been something really important. Now, uh, from uh, both written sources where the emperor is being described as talking to his troops, but also from looking more carefully at how he is being depicted talking to his troops, we can infer that, first of all, Trajan is always surrounded by other people advising him. He is not the single person standing there and speaking to, you're speaking down to the crowd, but he is always surrounded by advisors. So that tells you something about his role, how he sees his role. He is obviously the most important person, but he is taking in advice, which is demonstrating his, his care and his wisdom of not being deluded. He can know everything himself um, by taking advice from others. We can also see from, you know, how he is 
uh, how everybody is listening very carefully. And if we also take into account what we see in the written sources, when we actually look out for descriptions of him addressing his troops, that this was considered um, a, a, an act, a very important act of communication, not just explaining to the soldiers what they are going to do next and what and why, but also to convey to them that the emperor is not a distant person who, you know, is hardly ever seen, but that the emperor is part of the troops. Um, he is, of course, the most important one and the commander in chief and all the rest of it. But he doesn't consider himself to be, you know, import too important to actually speak to everybody. But he is creating a sense of community and of everybody standing together and creating a common sense of purpose so that the war will, the, the next battle will then be victorious. So this ad locutio is actually um, an indication of a certain um, characteristic of a certain behavior of the emperor towards his troops um, that was seen as appropriate of a good emperor. This is what a good emperor does. He speaks to his troops and he surrounds himself by advisors. And this is also why we see uh, this in a very abbreviated form um, on the coins. I should say this is a coin not of Trajan, but of, of Nero. Um, but, um, you know, that, that's one I could find with the, with the label underneath showing a similar uh, scene in abbreviated format. Um, there are other things um, which reoccur on the column in many places. And they are, again, not necessarily directly, one might think, relevant for the victory over barbarian forces. And this is lots of Roman soldiers, which we can identify from, from the breastplates they are wearing. The barbarians never wear breastplates. So we have here, you know, Trajan again addressing these people. And in the background, we have Roman soldiers um, building, building a fortress, building some campsite. Um, you know, some, um, and uh, we can see different building activities being depicted here. We have a similar thing over here. Let me just move and, and see. So here we have again, you know, some architecture being created um, and, uh, and, and various, uh, you know, with the various um, uh, uh, tasks that need to be accomplished. We also have scenes of of uh, wood cutting for timber because to build roofs and certain elements of buildings you need timber. Um, so the the cutting of trees is being depicted and another example of building works going on where actually Trajan is standing in the center and overlooking it. So it is made very clear that these building activities occur um, because the emperor wants this to happen. So he is the mastermind behind all of this happening. Now, why are the Romans depicted here doing lots of building works? I think there are a number of different, uh, a number of answers to that. One links back what I said earlier about the inscription on the column, which proudly commemorates the engineering work which was done before the forum could be built, that the hill was reduced to a flat landscape. So pride in being able to build, to build efficiently, to build in, in, in a very, you know, to build masonry work. Whereas um, I'm, I'm, we can't see that in, in these images, but um, there, there are also um, images of the Dacian villages 
which were obviously not built of ashlar blocks, but they were built of, um, you know, wood and and wool and daub and and perishable materials. So there is a real stress here on the column on buildings being done in a modern, highly professional kind of way. And when you think again of the first scene on the column with the bridge about across the Danube, which was constructed of lots of boats, that is another engineering feat for which Apollodorus of Damascus was also famous. And we have this mentioned in various um, literary sources. Um, and the, the Danube is, of course, a very, very wide river. So it's not easy to build a bridge about this this strong and wide river. But he came up with the with with the genius idea of building a bridge of boats. Um, and and that is commemorated in in several ancient sources. And this is where also which what is also easiest to see. And you can see that when you look on 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 the web, all the tourists photograph the you know the beginning of that relief because this is what you see at at first when you approach the column. And also for in the ancient world, the ancient viewers would have seen that first. But then there are lots of other engineering and building works going on. So there is some genuine pride here on the column um, in being able to build. And if you think of the Forum of Trajan as a whole, that was also an enormous building uh, um, that was realized in very short time. Um, and larger than any of the other fora. Um, and so um, we, we have at various levels here a celebration of Roman, of, of the Roman capacity of, um, you know, their technical abilities in the realm of public building, essentially, and of, of engineering. Um, so that is celebrated on this column. And to some extent, this is quite unrelated to the Dacian Wars, but it also becomes important in the context of the wars because we can see the contrast between the little huts of the Dacians and the beautiful buildings the Romans created in Dacia. And so what they are actually demonstrating here is their cultural, technical and cultural superiority, um, which also, and this we get also from, from texts, of course, um, which is part of the justification for Roman imperialism, if you want. You know, um, conquering foreign lands was justified to some extent um, by saying, you know, we are culturally superior, we bring civilization into those barbaric lands. So there, there is a, there, there is a, um, a message in these building works, which is actually extremely important for the identity of the Romans, of what they feel they are proud about, and what they think is also helping to justify conquering barbarian lands, which is bringing civilization to the savage people. Um, I suppose if we think back of um, to to our own colonialist parts, uh, a past uh, in you know Europeans conquering America, conquering Africa, there was the same rhetoric um, that you know we bring. Uh, we bring a Christian religion, of course, and the Romans didn't care so much about religion in that context. But, you know, we bring Christian religion to the people who don't know it yet. But we also we bring civilization because we are much superior. That was much of the rhetoric that was applied in our own colonialist past. But um, we were not the first to 
argue that way, but it was exactly what the Romans also argued. And we see that in some of the texts and we see that expressed in the public monuments. So this is not just, you know, a nice illustration of what they did on the way to, um, uh, you know, on their campaign, uh, but there are lots of messages about Roman identity and justifying the war. Uh, oh yeah, I put the I put this um, this image here. I had um, for, I know you you can see you can see that here again, and actually another image. This is a plaster cast which you find in in Rome. So sometimes these old plaster casts are easier uh, to see than than uh, more modern photographs. Um, so let's see what time have we got. Um, maybe we we do this next um, this this next type of scenes and then we have a break. Um, profectio is another one. Profectio, the label which I put here, um, is again something we find on coins. So these sort of keywords we often get from coins. The profectio, the actual the 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 exit towards the leaving a place to go to another campaign or to go to another battle. This is again something that is depicted over and over again on the column. And again, we could say, you know, why is this important? But it is, of course, showing the readiness of the troops for battle. They move forward without any fear. So it is an expression of their virtus. When we look at how they are actually exiting, this is a very orderly way so we can see again that they are not just a chaotic bunch as the barbarians are normally depicted, but they are doing it very orderly and systematically. And so the profectio is, um, uh, is expressing also the readiness for battle. Um, uh, yeah, we have other scenes where you know people are just marching or say in this case uh, using boats um, to march so these scenes um, occur several times um, we have a lot of sacrifice there but um, we'll talk about that after the break so we take a 10 minute break Right, so I think um, we can continue. And uh, the images here on the screen um, that you may have studied already a little bit um, are showing another theme that reoccurs plenty of times on the column, and that is various kinds of sacrifices. Um, what you can see here, sacrifices that consist of, um, of a bull, and of a sheep and also of a pig um, are um, lustrationes. They are um, sacrifices, um, purification rituals, um, which are also considered important for the success um, of a military campaign. And so there is an obvious link um, with that to um, the success of the military com campaign. Um, but you can also see again how the emperor is always present as the person overseeing these sacrifices. Um, we can see him here. Well, this, these are all the, the people who are doing that. This is actually not a lustratio. This is um, several bulls being uh, sacrificed here. But here you have a lustratio. You see the emperor here sacrificing over a burning altar, um, doing a libation. This is one of the uh, colored illustrations of how, I mean, I should say that there are no pigments left on the column. It has unfortunately been cleaned and washed down with rainwater so much that there are no pigments left on the column. Um, but, you know, th this is this is one idea that 
that you know gives some idea of of how it would have looked like in color and with the emperor in the red purple toga he would have stood out and it it sort of indicates how the color makes the image much more readable than when we just have you know the the, the homogeneous color of the white marble so the emperor is sacrificing uh, on various occasions um, so uh, here we have him again and also over there in this case we have a sacrifice uh, inside this new um, this this new um, fort. Um, he is wearing not a military dress in these instances but the toga which is a civil dress um, pulled over his head as is the Roman custom and um, again, there are multiple layers of why this is important. Um, first of all, as I just indicated, these purification rituals were an important part of, uh, you know, what, what you had to do before a campaign um, to make sure that um, the gods look favorably on your campaign and that they support you. And uh, that is essentially part of making sure that the that the campaign will be successful um like all state rituals and sacrifices not just in military contexts but also in other contexts on roman state reliefs um they um are a very important indication of the emperor's um provision for the benefit of the people of the state and here of the army because only with the support of the gods could it be guaranteed that a military campaign would be successful, the, the people would be prosperous, um, the state would flourish. Um, so without the support of the gods, none of that could be guaranteed. And an emperor who serves the gods well and remembers to pay the gods tribute through um, sacrifices is providing well for the state. The other aspect is, of course, his personal piety, that this reflects on him as a person, that he is a pious person. Um, um, but we need to keep in mind that uh, when we talk about piety, it has a very Christian ring of a very personal sort of relationship with God. Whereas in the Roman context, pietas was a sense, more a sense of obligation, which ideally you would you would sincerely feel that obligation is something you feel is the right thing to do. So you would identify with that. Um, but it is not so much about creating a personal relationship with God or showing your, um, your personal involvement, but it is a sense of duty. Um, so you could have pietas erga parentes, pietas towards your your um, uh, your um, ancestors, um, which uh, you know would be used for this with the same term. It was also pietas towards the state. Um, so this term pietas is one that doesn't only apply to the relationship with the gods, but also to um, other important relationships. But pietas towards the gods was a very, very important one. And so we shouldn't be surprised to find this um, several occasions on the column of Trajan. Then, of course, there are battle scenes. You may have wondered whether they ever come. Um, we do have a number of battle scenes. Um, and that is also interesting to see what kinds of battle scenes we have. Um, there are battle scenes where, like in these two examples, where again we can see the technical and tactical strategic superiority 
of the Romans. This is particularly indicative uh, where we, we see the Romans advancing and um, uh, you can see the wooden palisades of, um, of an indigenous um, village and the Romans are advancing here um, in an organized way with pulling the shields over their heads so that none of the arrows or whatever is being thrown at them could hit them. So it's technical and tactical superiority which we see here. Um, but even in this image, uh, we can see the Romans are there with their spears, which must have been made of bronze because we only see the holes in the hands. It looks a bit silly today, but there must have been bronze spears at the time. They have their shields and helmets um, and are, you know, well protected by their extremely well built fort, uh, whereas this is just a wooden palisade. Um, and the barbarians who are attacking them. Um, have, you know, a few, there are a few shields, but otherwise they don't have breastplates or any other armor. They're just shooting with arrows. They don't have any helmets. Um, so they are much less organized and well equip equipped than the Romans. So that tells us a little bit about the, the um, you know, hierarchy of, of um, military skills and military equipments between the Dacians and the Romans. The other thing which is also inter interesting is, however, that in the battle scenes, we do not see only Roman victory. It is not just the triumph of the Romans going in, but we have scenes like these where the barbarians actually attack a Roman camp. Um, so they are being presented as, to some extent, dangerous. Um, and an aggressive people attacking the Romans. And we have even a number of other scenes which look quite tumultuous here, where it is almost hard to differentiate between the Roman soldiers, which do have helmets, that helps, and the Dacians, who are actually here, um, sort of on top of the Romans and and really pose a very dangerous threats to these Roman soldiers here. So they are not just presented as completely incapable and but they are presented also as dangerous enemies. And we have a similar scene here where Roman soldiers and Dacians are fighting each other and it is not not clear in the first instance, who is going to be the victorious party. Now, this is interesting um, if we compare this with the column of Marcus, which I will show towards the end very briefly, because there the situation is quite different. Why would the Romans do that? Obviously, when you are fighting against um, a dangerous enemy, that and you are eventually successful, that enhances your own triumph because you are not, you know, you, you, you really have to make an effort. Um, it is not just some weaklings which can easily be overrun, but the real um, virtus um, and the real bravery and the triumph will be all the greater the more dangerous and powerful the enemy is. So that is surely one reason why uh, we have the Romans here not being only always ever triumphant, but also showing the dangers into which the army uh, was going uh, in the war. Um, yeah, finally, uh, when the Romans then were victorious, um, the emperor would have to decide what happens with the local population, with the local soldiers, but also with the rest of the local po um, population. And for that reason, we have quite a few scenes that show the aftermath of battles. And there are essentially two different reactions of the emperor to the outcome of those fights. One is Clementia, 
and the other is justitia. And again, these are labels which we also find on coins over and over again. So these two concepts were very important. Clementia is when the emperor pardons the um, conquered peoples and he says, OK, you have been fighting us, but um, if you if you are happy to become members of the Roman state, and if you understand well that we are superior and we bring civilization to you, then you will be integrated into the Roman Empire. You will be able to continue your life. You will have your prosperity. You will have your freedom, uh, obviously within the framework of the Roman Empire. But we pardon you uh, and in turn you behave well in the future and you, you, you no longer pose any threat um, to the Roman Empire. Um, on the other hand, where the local population did then not accept that it is good for them to become integrated into the Roman Empire, according to Roman terms, and they would do, for instance, what Decebalus did after the first victory and the peace treaty that was um, that was agreed. But when they then become aggressive again, justitia would be the result, like in this scene here, where we have barbarians being beheaded. Um, in this scene. On the column of Trajan, this is a very rare scene. So Trajan, most of the time, is being depicted um, is, is being depicted as um, as someone offering clemencia, someone reacting positively, friendly towards the barbarians, but every now and then it is being made clear that you must better not mess with him. And if you if you don't accept the peace according to Roman terms, then you are in real trouble. But these scenes are very rare. Oops, uh, what did I do there? Um, I have a few others here. Um, so, so this is another scene where they are asking uh, for the emperor's clemencia, and there are, you know, submit in submitting to him. The emperor is over here, unfortunately, not in this image. Um, and other scenes. This is then the happy barbarians that have been integrated into the Roman Empire. This is the situation which the Romans wanted to achieve. They bring happiness and and uh, prosperity. Um, to the local population where we have children and women and elderly people and everyone being happy to welcome the emperor who has brought peace and, uh, you know, all the wonderful things the Romans could provide um, to their provinces. So, again, these clementia and justitia scenes are part of the overall concept of why and how the German, the 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 the, uh, the Romans would um, would uh, react, would would extend their empire, and what their idea of an empire really was. Um, here I have put. Well, you can't read that, I'm sure, but this is a scheme that has been done by a German scholar, Tonio Hölzer, where he has labelled all these different um, these different events. And on that, you can actually see, you know, sacrifice, lustratio, which is also sacrifice. Um, and and I should have I should have highlighted this in 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 color. Um, the various, so the, the repeating scenes, if you put them down in such a scheme, you can see that, that they repeat themselves. And so for the message and the legibility of the column, we see that actually it isn't, it isn't really necessary to go around and round and round and look at all the different scenes. It is not about documenting the individual events of the war. It is exemplifying key concepts 
of Roman identity and warfare and imperialism and key virtues of the emperor. That's the message behind that. And uh, this is why we have all these um, events reoccurring all the time. And for the viewer, it would suffice to know that this is not just, you know, like the personification of Pietas, a totally abstract concept of virtues, of ideas. But the true events which are signaled here, the true events um, demonstrate the character features of the emperor and they exemplify the concepts on which the Roman state is built. So it is important here both the fact that there were real events of a war and the more general concepts that persist into the future. So this is not just a monument about a one a, 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 an, a, an event over you know three years or so, a one a one time event which becomes irrelevant after a certain time. It is about general ideas that are being exemplified through the wars and everything that was involved here. Um, what is the time? Finally, um, I promised to do a, a very brief um, comparison to the column of Marcus, which I think highlights um, the importance of the way the events are being depicted on the column of, um, of Trajan. Um, very briefly, a few facts on the column. It is here in the Campus Martius. Uh, so this is the Circus Maximus, always easy to identify in the Colosseum and the Forum uh, Romanum is here and the Forum of Trajan over there. In the Campus Martius, there is this beautiful column here um, with, uh, you, have, you have a few dates here on the slide, um, built um, in the in the 180s or early 190s, uh, not by Marcus Aurelius himself or during his lifetime, but by his um, successor, son and successor uh, Commodus in honor of Marcus Aurelius. Um, and the context is again a context of war, a war, another um, war against um, northern, northeastern barbarians, the Marcomannic wars against Germans and Samaritans, um, tribes that had uh, threatened the Roman, the borders of the Roman Empire. These wars um, actually continued over a pretty long period of time between 166 probably and 180 uh, when Marcus Aurelius died. And um, these, um, this war um, is actually special in the history of the High Roman Empire in that the war started actually by barbaric raids across the border to Italy itself. It was after the Republic, the first time, so for, for much over a hundred years, it was the first time that barbarians actually intruded into Northern Italy and threatened even to come towards Rome. And that must have been a total shock to the Roman Empire and to the Roman to the Roman government. And I think we can compare that to some extent like how the Americans felt at 9-11. This just didn't, this just wasn't on their radar. Nobody ever thought that barbarians could enter into Italy and really threaten Rome, that they would kill people in Italy. Barbarian fights were normally in the provinces far away, but that they would threaten Italy and Rome was absolutely extraordinary. And this sense of suddenly realizing how vulnerable they were must have been a true shock. Also, the, uh, the wars that then ensued 
Um, uh, oh yeah, I, I, I had I put the date here, which um, since one hundred and one, that was you know that so. 250, more than 250 years since no barbarians have ever invaded Italy. Um, the fights that then ensued were actually long and very hard with lots of losses um, on both sides, but including on the Roman side. So for the Romans, it, was, it wasn't an easy victory at all to drive back these tribes in the Marcomannic War. So that was a very, very different kind of war from the one that Trajan had fought, uh, which was, you know, the Dacians hadn't invaded the empire. They were sort of, you know, they, they it, it was really an, an, a colonialist kind of war, to be honest, whereas this was a war of defense. Um, very briefly, um, you know, the, the, there are lots of similarities. Again, the sort of spiral relief uh, where we have the profectio over a bridge at the beginning um, and, and then the scenes develop towards um, the top. Uh, just from the technical point of view, you can see um, that the reliefs on the column of Trajan are actually very, very shallow. There is not much depth in these reliefs, whereas um, in the Antonine period, um, uh, it, it, towards the you know the end of the second century, um, we have a very high relief where some figures are almost you know hardly attached to the background, and um, oh, unfortunately now there is a lot of black which comes from the pollution, and um, uh, but even when this is not there, there's a lot of light and shade. So the, the technical, the stylistic and technical things are much different in this period of time. But it is not just a sort of general development of style, which we can see here, but we also see a heightened drama, which is partly created to the different style of carving, but also partly through the iconography. Um, we find on the column very similar scenes to what we have on the column of Trajan. We have profectiones, we have adlocuciones, even though, as you will notice here, this is the emperor. Um, he is standing much higher above his troops. So that signifies a shift in the relationship between the emperor and everybody else towards late antiquity, where the distance to the general population, including the army, becomes ever greater. So you can, th 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 this is how, you know, the choice of how you depict an event is as important as what is the being depicted. So that's what I always tell my students for you. This is, of course, not new, but that engaging with the language of the images is really bringing out additional information and uh, just sticking a label on is not good enough. This only gives you the first level of understanding, but studying the details of the composition and the style is what is uh, then giving you lots of, in, uh, lots of uh, additional information. And this can be brought out perhaps best in the battle scenes, which on the column of Marcus are by far the, the largest number of scenes. On the column of Trajan, battle scenes are in the minority and every all the other scenes um, are, you know, they all together anyway, um, are far, far more frequent than the battle scenes themselves. The battles are there, but they are not the most prominent subject. While on the column of Marcus, the battle scenes are the most frequent scenes that we see. There, you know, there, there are lots and lots of battle scenes. I have picked out a few which bring out the different way the battles are being depicted particularly well. And um, in these two scenes, you can see here on the left, obviously here we have the huts of the barbarians. These are already on fire. And what we get, unfortunately, not terribly well preserved, but still worth looking at. We have here 
in the top, on the top, it, we have in, in many of these images, we have sort of two tiers, two registers of stains. Even in one single scene, it is sort of uh, divided into two halves, an upper one and a lower one. And in these battle scenes, most of the time, we have the Romans on the top and the barbarians at the bottom. Here we have a Roman um, you know, cutting down barbarians here, and there are some barbarians over there as well. Um, so um, here there is also a horizontal development of the battle. What is interesting here is the barbarians are not just not very well equipped with armor, but these are already, you know, they, they, he will receive his death blow in a moment. He is probably about to die. These are cowardly, trying to run away, but are being followed by the Romans. So we can imagine they will be caught any time, but they are also cowards. They don't even fight the Romans and they are running away. This image is even starker. We have all the Romans here on the top. Most of the barbarians here at the bottom, they are not fighting. They are pleading for their life, but obviously without any hope for mercy, they are going to be killed in the next moment. The only figure that is reaching into the upper tier is this guy here, but he is turning his back to the Romans. So he is obviously also running away and is presented as a coward here. So we have a very, very different presentation of the barbarians and, or the relationship between the Roman troops and the barbarian troops um, in the column of Marcus than we have seen on the column of Trajan. And that is not just the sort of formal stylistic characteristic, um, but it is saying something about the historical relationship between the barbarians and the Romans. Here, there is absolutely no ambiguity about the barbarians having no chance whatsoever to pose a real challenge to the Romans. The Romans are always superior and triumphant, and the barbarians are just being crushed. When we consider the historical context, what I just said about this traumatic experience of the barbarians entering into Italy, we can see why the Romans may have felt this necessary to present the barbarians in this way, quite contrary to the real life events where they were a real threat, who also kept the Romans engaged for a long time throughout the wars. But to the Roman people, the events were presented in such a way that there was no doubt about the superiority of the Romans and the base kind of character of the barbarians. And we can also see that in the way that the barbarians are being treated after the victories. And we see lots of, uh, of, of beheadings on the column of Marcus. We see also even women and children being attacked by Roman, uh, by Roman soldiers, which we never see on the column of Trajan. So the barbarian peoples are being, this, this again, you know, we have him being, being beheaded. And in this case, the emperor is even overseeing this, whereas in the relevant scene on the column of Trajan, the emperor wasn't wasn't you know was was further away so the, so I, I think these images and I will stop here to give you the chance of asking questions um, the barbarians are really crushed they are characterized as true barbarians who do not um, who do not merit to be integrated into the wonderful world of the Roman Empire but where the point is, to crush them completely, and that is um, is is linked to the political events behind that. So, um, uh, to 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 stop here, um, I hope I have demonstrated that these historical reliefs, which are now mostly called state reliefs, um, 
are referring to real historical events, but in a very particular language that says something about Roman identity, about Roman imperialism, um, about the character of the empire, emperor. And in this way, using historical events in order to generate general messages. That's the one thing. The other thing that the exact stylistic and compositional way in which these events are being depicted are part of the message and help us understand the real idea behind those events. Right, thank you very much. Questions? Um, you can ask in Italian if you prefer. I don't know whether anyone online, I can't see you, but if there are any questions from, from colleagues online, uh, I suppose you just shout. No, everybody exhausted from all that war, <laughs> warfare. Mi dispiace tanto che non potevo parlare in italiano. L'anno prossimo spero tanto che... Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, 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 niente. Um, it's, so, so, so you, you, you are asking about the, the uh, you, you are asking, if I understand correctly, you're asking two questions. One of the audience, who was the audience for this? And also how would they have, you know, how, how what would they have seen? How would they have understood this? As for the audience, um, strictly speaking, we don't really know because we do not know who was allowed to enter into this courtyard. And you could not see much from outside of the forum. So only people who would enter into this courtyard would have been able to get close. Now, we know that in the basilica, there were lots of, uh, that was used for, for trade, um, for banking, also for court cases, um, for public acts. So there was a lot of business in the basilica. And if we believe what colleagues in Rome propose, that the entrance was where the column was into the forum and into the basilica, people would in fact have entered through the courtyard and then into the basilica to go about their business. If this is right, a lot of people of all social, of the whole social hierarchy would have been able to see the column very closely. To me, this is the most likely scenario because there is no other big entrance that would allow access to the basilica. So this, I would, I would consider it very likely that pretty much anyone who had a legitimate business 
in the basilica and in the forum would be able to enter on that side. Now, the, the question of how people would then have seen the column, I suppose understanding that the types of scenes repeat themselves is part of the answer. Because if it is not the purpose that you go round and round and round until you're totally dizzy to follow the events of the war, but if it is more about understanding the general idea of the emperor and imperialism at the time, then it suffices that you stand on one side and you will see a profectio, a sacrifice, a battle, a, you know, you would have examples of all of these kinds of scenes on just when you're just standing on one side of the column. Um, and, uh, and it would then be the sort of knowledge that this is, you know, that, that there is the same also on the other sides, but you do not need to go round and round and round to actually experience it. Is that an answer to your question? Good. Yes, please. Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. Sì, ovviamente per quelli che, che avevano uh, accesso alla galleria, they would have been able to see everything much more clearly and in greater detail because you could look up and look down, whereas when you're only on the bottom, you know, um, so, so for them it would have been much easier. Um, for the libraries, it is much more difficult for us to know who would have been granted access. Surely that must have been limited because, you you know, our libraries, even when they are public, you can't just enter at liberty. Um, um, so that must have been more restricted access, but probably still quite a lot of, quite a large number of of people, administrators, surely from the, you know, the state administration, but probably also our authors, Tacitus, Suetonius, Pliny, they found their information in that kind of libraries where they could read up on the documentations of the wars and document, you know, all these kinds of documents. So, I would imagine that there was a good number of different people, um, but not just anyone. See. Si. Esatto. Esatto. Mm -hmm. Sì, giusto. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Sì. Sì. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. No, era, era una, um, it, 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 it was the connection between the arcs, the, you know, the, the Capitoline Hill, the arcs, and then the Quirinal Hill, and, and there was a kind of bridge, so it, it wasn't, it wasn't a, a separate, um, a separate hill, but it was the sort of bridge from the arcs that was then cut away. No, sorry, not the Quirinal, the Esquiline it is, is it it? No, it's a Quirinal. 
Sí, sí. And it, it, it must have been a huge change to the landscape, also to the viabilita, um, because, you know, if you had this this sort of bridge, you had to go over the, you know, from, from outside the walls, you had to go over the hill and then down to the forum, whereas when the forum of Trajan was done and the hill was cut down, it was much easier to... Uh, you know, like we we go today, today it's all flat, and we take it for granted, but it wasn't always like that. Other questions? Yes, please. Sorry, I can't I can't hear you. Le scenere della, nella colonna di Traiano? Ok, sì, sì. Um, la, la, la prima domanda prima del, del propaganda. Um, propaganda is, is a, a very difficult term because it is very loaded with experience from our own days where we have print media and radio and television and now social media um, where, you know, you can send out messages to vast numbers of people and influence public opinion. This kind of propaganda did not exist, maybe to some extent on the coins, but it depends on whether we believe that the people looked really at the coins and, you know, all the time when they used them. Um, but th there was, I, I would suppose, the coins were some sort of propaganda. And there were obviously messages in the coin images, but also in the public monuments, as we have seen. But the audience was limited. Many of the coins were only used by the rich people, by the military in particular. Many coins were minted just to pay the military and were never really circulating outside that realm. The monuments in Rome were only seen by people who actually lived in Rome or came visiting to Rome. So um, there, while there were messages, it was not messages by a central authority to the general public. But it was for a lot of time the a kind of messaging also among the elite between the people who were dedicating the monuments, in particular the Senate, and the emperor. So the emperor was not primarily the one sending a message to everybody else, but he was also the one receiving the message. Because if you praise someone for being good at, say, if I say you are a fantastic teacher and you are really caring about your students, um, say, if I'm a parent of, your, of, a, of, of one of your pupils, I'm saying that obviously to pay tribute to, to, to your achievement, but I'm also saying this to say, you know, hopefully do you, you are a good teacher and kind to my, 
you to my children in the future. So, you know, praise is 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 always part of a negotiation of a relationship between people. And 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 this then starts to become much more interesting and much more complex than just propaganda as a message from an author to the general public. The other question about um, whether the base of the tra of Trajan's column was actually his tomb. No, no ashes have been found there. Non ci sono generi. Non ci sono olle o urne o niente. The, nothing has been found inside or not documented in any way. Um, the only thing we know is that from ancient literary sources that Trajan was buried, um, his ashes were buried I think the term that is used is um, su, but that can mean directly underneath the column, but it could also mean close by. And so the written sources are ambiguous in their language. And it was the idea of some scholar at the beginning of the 20th century, I forgot who it was, who started suggesting that the ashes were actually buried in this small chamber. But when you when you look at the chamber, it is the most the most impossible place. It is extremely narrow. There is no place for doing funerary rites. There is no embellishment. It is just, you know, naked stone. It is the, there is no chamber separate from the access to the stairs. So the maintenance of the stairs, you would always walk past this little chamber. So it, it is, it is, it is not a, it is not a suitable place really for the burial of an emperor, which we would imagine to be a bit grander, a bit more embellished. And finally, there is no inscription on the column's base that would indicate in any way that Trajan and Plotina were buried there. And we would probably accept, expect there to be at least something that would indicate the burial within that block if it had been there. So those are essentially the arguments against um, the assumption, the reconstruction of the burial site being there. Any other questions? No. Okay. Grazie per la vostra attenzione e una buona serata a tutte e tutti.